grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God's mercy endures forever. For thousands of years, First Nations peoples have lived on this land. This relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We are gathered as a predominantly non-Indigenous community of faith on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish First Nations peoples. And we acknowledge their stewardship through the ages. We seek to live together in respect, friendship, and peace. Jesus calls us into the world to love one another as we are loved by my God. Jesus Christ, the light of the world, the true light which enlightens everyone, the light that dispels the darkness, illuminates our way, and shines the glory of God into our hearts. Our opening hymn is found at Voices United number 108 throughout these Lenten days and nights. service is one that many Christian communities have observed through the centuries with great devotion in order to mark the beginning of Lent. In the earliest years of the church, Lent became a time to prepare for Easter by contemplating how we grow as disciples of Jesus. Fasting as a pathway into deeper connection with the divine and studying prayerfully to delve more deeply into the heart of God. 
Lent was the 40-day season within which converts to the way of Jesus prepared for their baptism into the body of Christ on Holy Saturday, the day before Easter. It also became a time when people who had committed serious sins, thus separating themselves from the believing and practicing community of faith, sought reconciliation, forgiveness, and restoration into the family of faith. By observing Ash Wednesday, the whole congregation is reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the living Christ, to observe a holy land through self-examination, intentional prayer, serving others, and studying God's Word and Scripture within us and around us. Let us come before God in confession. Let us pray together as one. The ways I have wronged you and others dirty me, O God. Cleanse me, I pray, that the grime is washed away, that in your loving care and abundant forgiveness I am made new. In my alienation from you, take away my tears and my sorrow, transforming me through your joy-filled reshaping, restoring my heart through a willing spirit that lives love. Hear my rededication to you as I pray silently. separate us from God. Know that you are already forgiven. Know that you are deeply loved. And how Wright and Bob Gilbert will read scripture for us today. 
This is a reading from the book of Proverbs. My child, if you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the acknowledge, knowledge of God. My child, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and abundance welfare they will give you. Do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them round your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and of people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge God, and the Lord will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be a healing for your flesh, and a refreshment for your body. Look at your hands. See the touch and tenderness. God's, God's home for, for the world. world. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puah, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. Look at your feet. See the path and direction. God's own for the world. Now a reading from the Gospel according to John. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Look at your heart. See the fire and love. God's own for the world. And a reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your God in heaven. For the Lord makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Look at the cross. See God's Son and our Liberator. God's own for the world. Let us pray. 
Now, O God, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. This reflection was inspired by an Ash Wednesday meditation by Deborah Reinstra. And she, like me, some years ago, read a beautiful novel entitled Gilead by Marilyn Robinson. Gilead is the story of a 76-year-old Iowa pastor reflecting on his life for the sake of his young son born to him in his old age. In one passage, this pastor recalls a moment from his own childhood when he watched the community come together to help take down what was left of a church that had been struck by lightning. They have one day to do this before harvest, and that day happens to be pouring rain. I'd like to read a short passage so that we have this image in our minds as we think about ashes today. The narrator describes taking shelter from the rain with the other young children under a wagon while the grown-ups worked. Then he writes, The ashes turned liquid in the rain, and the men who were working in the ruins got entirely dirty and filthy till you could hardly know one from another. My father brought me some biscuit that had soot on it from his hands. Never mind, he said, there's nothing cleaner than ash. But it affected the taste of that biscuit, which I thought might have tasted like the bread of affliction, which was often mentioned in those days, though it's mostly forgotten now. I remember my father down on his heels in the rain, water dripping from his hat, feeding me that biscuit from his scorched hand with the old blackened wreck of a church behind him and steam rising where the rain fell on embers, the rain falling in gusts and the women singing the old rugged cross while they saw to things, moving so gently as if they were dancing to the hymn almost. It was so joyful and sad. I mention it because it seems to me much of my life was comprehended in that moment. Grief itself has often returned me to that morning when I took communion from my father's hand. I remember it as communion, and I believe that's what it was. In this lovely passage, in the midst of a burned out wreck, ashes mix with rain, and a biscuit becomes a holy moment, a sacrament. Today is Ash Wednesday, and we commune with God through the symbol of ashes. Ashes mean repentance. When the ancient prophets spoke out against the waywardness of the people as a sign of needed repentance, a sign of sorrow for sins committed, the prophets and others would dress in sackcloth and ashes. Ashes as well are a reminder that we are dust. Earth to earth, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, we say, at a committal service for one who has died. Ashes are created when something is burned and destroyed. Ashes mean death. Ash Wednesday draws us into Lent. When we reflect on our own sins, on Jesus' 40 days of solitude and temptation in the wilderness, and on this world's darkness. This is a wise and good tradition. We should reflect on these things, and this discipline prepares us for the joy of Easter. But the trouble with the church here sometimes is that where we are in our own lives does not always quite mesh with the dates on the calendar. Sometimes it's hard, really hard, to get into the spirit of things at the right moment. I'm sure you know what I mean. Maybe for you, you see Lent coming around and you think, oh, I don't want to be all sad right now. Things are going pretty well. I love where my life is at. I have wonderful friends and family. I'm excited for the future. I want to praise God. And now I'm supposed to put on a serious face and think about death and sin. How about if I take a rain check? 
Or maybe you've already experienced enough sadness. You see Lent coming and you think, huh, I know all about ashes and death. I have been walking through this valley for a long time already. And maybe for you, life is a struggle right now. Maybe it always has been. Or you live with a chronic illness and every day feels like a battle. Or some kind of lightning has struck your life and you've watched people you love suffer and die. Or you have lived someplace or visited someplace where injustice and corruption and poverty drove you mad with sorrow and frustration. For you, Lent on the horizon looks like more of the same, just more labor among the burned out wreck of the world. You've tasted the bread of affliction plenty. And what you'd really like instead is maybe some relief, some joy and gladness for us. But I wonder, I wonder if we're thinking about Lent in the wrong way. Maybe we need to remember that even in the Lenten season, even on Ash Wednesday, that we worship a God of abundance and of life and of goodness. Maybe some of you who are gardeners, and I know there are a lot of gardeners in our congregation, maybe you know that ashes can actually make excellent fertilizer. Ash, created by burning plant matter, is full of calcium, potassium, magnesium, and other trace elements. It can restore the pH balance of overly acidic soil. This is one reason why some forest ecosystems need occasional fires in order to spring back to life and thrive again. But of course, even in your own garden, you have to use ash sparingly and in the right context. Too much will make the soil too alkaline, and of course, you have to add water. So what if we were to enter Lent thinking about ashes, not as God's call to be glum and serious and morbid, but as God's call to a different kind of abundance? Not the kind we focus on most of the time. Abundance of material things like food, and safe housing, and economic prosperity. The kind that comes and gets distributed all unevenly in the world. But rather, what if we focus on the kind of abundance God offers? Generously and without limit, in those places we go to enter God's presence. In prayer in the study of the Word, in worship, in good friendships, in times of rich and beautiful silence, in acts of mercy. Could we think of Lent as a time to enter into that abundance? You may be planning to give something up for Lent or practice some other kind of discipline, Perhaps support a worthwhile charity or cause or read a daily devotional resource or take a Bible or faith study online. Those are good things to do. But maybe we can let these disciplines and deprivations be for us a way to a different kind of joy. We could let them clear the underbrush so that we can taste and see God's abundance waiting to grow and thrive in the richness of prayer and worship, solitude and service. And we can remember too that ashes must be used sparingly and in the right contexts, and we need to add water. Fortunately, we enter this time of ashes already bearing water with us, the water of baptism. Even Jesus needed this. He entered the wilderness of silence and meditation only after his baptism. In this Christian community and the traditions of the church, the waters of baptism are already pouring down all around us. These waters are a sign and seal that although we may be dirtied with ash from our labor in this wreck of a world, although we are dust, we are dust coming to new and abundant life by water and the Spirit. This year, may the ashes of Lent mix with the waters of our baptism and draw us into the abundance of God's own presence. 
May the bread of affliction become for all of us the bread of communion with our Lord. Amen. The hymn of response uh, for today's message is found on Voices United, Voices United, number 578. <laughs> We repent and believe in the gospel. Gospel. 
And we're now going to sing We Are Pilgrims, which is found at Voices United, number 595. Amen. It's from a dance form called a Sarah Bond. <laughs> <laughs> 